You run one of the iconic companies in the world, Intel. Yes, sir. Uh, lots of people, I'm sure, I'm sure almost really everybody out here has some device running your processors and your... Hopefully several. Other semiconductors. Several devices. Several devices, maybe. Um, but uh, you're not in a large number of mobile phones. Uh, and, um, you know, that's been the big volume device of the, uh, in, in recent years. PC sales have been either down or flat, depending on the quarter you pick for quite a while now. Yep. Uh, and you're pivoting Intel, and I want, I want to talk about that. But just to start, I mean, what, what is your sense of the PC market, which has obviously been a super important market to you? Uh, I, I know you're looking ahead and you're pivoting, but t talk about the PC market for a minute. Well, um, you know, I think first there's, there's been a lot of innovation that's occurred in the PC over the last couple of years, especially. So the, the, the complaints that people have had about ease of use and battery life, those are all getting, getting much, much better. And you're going to see some real innovation in form factor, size, usability, multiple screens coming over the next couple of years. It is, multiple screens in, in laptops, or are you talking about? Uh, yeah, think of, no, think of it like a, you know, most of the people out here probably in some ways use like a notebook. Right. right. Not a notebook PC, but like have a notebook. Like a can, written notebook, yeah. But imagine if that was your PC and it had, you know, uh, the ability to, when you wanted a keyboard, it had a keyboard. And when you wanted a color screen, it had color screen. When you wanted uh, e-ink, you had e-ink. Those are the kinds of things. That's what you mean by multiple screen. I get yeah, it. those are the kinds of real useful work devices that are going to be coming. I'd buy that. Maybe I won't retire and I'll review yeah. that. That's but, but, you know, so so... Let's talk about it. Yes, I, I, my view is the PC is, I think, nearing stability. Uh, you know, the, the estimates we have are low single digits, mid single digits decline this year. Some people are estimating, some of the third parties are estimating flat. Uh, you know, you can kind of see it's, it's, the decline has slowed. We've been able to raise our profitability even in that environment, even in that declining market. We've raised our profitability because we've added more performance and people are actually buying up. So Core i7, and now we've introduced Core i9. Nine, yeah. More confusion. Yeah. Thanks. No, no. It's just always what. Oh, you got to read that little. What performance do you want? Tag at Best Buy. Is it an i3? Is an i? And the, and the guy's always going to want you to. You, you can't possibly do your word. It's, it's simple. Unless you get an i9. It's simple. Just always buy the, the best Thank processor you, you, know, you can afford. I'll tell you, for years I always said, Always buy the lowest priced processor you can find, well, as long as it's in. I did say Intel. Okay. But buy the cheapest Intel processor, if you're just doing, you know. Yeah, it depends web on your work. surfing and sure. word it, processing it, and stuff like. But most that. people now want to game and do some of that. Yeah, I get it. If you're a gamer, so, I always did. I did say if you're a gamer, it's a different story, but um, your i3 and your i5 are, are pretty damn good chips. Right, but. Go buy an 18-core i9 uh, if you want to really game. With uh, soon, you'll have it with a uh, uh, you know uh, uh, 3D crosspoint Optane uh, module in there, so you have instant on and, and preloads of of game levels and you know a high-speed SSD and All right. this thing is going to cook. Still, but, but if you look at Intel, you know right now this year. Uh, 60, between 60 and 70 percent of our, of our profit will come from the growth areas, which are outside the PC. Right. Cloud, you know, data center, memory, uh, uh, IoT. Those are the areas that are going to really fuel. And I, and I want to get to, I have one more PC question. Sure. Then we'll get to it. As we talked about it backstage, and I thought it was interesting. So I want to stress what I'm about to say I have absolutely no evidence for. <laughs> it's just things you read. So everybody knows, not, maybe not everybody, but Apple makes a lot of hardware products, but they're, I think they may be the only major PC maker that has a serious silicon design operation in their company. And that's, you know, if you have an iPhone or an iPad or 
any of the mobile de uh, devices, not PC, not, the, not Macs, that's an Apple chip in there. They don't build it, but they design it. And there are rumors that they're looking to replace, they use Intel processors. Famously, they switched many years ago to Intel processors. It's worked out very well for those of us who use their Mac. Um, but uh, there are rumors that since they do have a lot of expertise in designing processors and they've been doing it on high volume things like the iPhone, that they might just switch the Mac over to ARM and not use Intel anymore. Is that a possibility? Well, or what's your yeah? I, so I don't have any insight into you know. Okay. Th clearly, they're not going to open that project up to me if they do have it. Uh, uh -huh. But you know, our, our perspective is that, um, especially with Apple, they're they're very competitive, and they always, you know, Apple lives on having the best product with the best performance, best battery life, you know, form factor, all, all of that. Our job, um, and, and so I, I actually believe that somewhere inside that company, probably somebody is always trying to see if they can use their ARM-based cores to scale up into that space. They, they, they'd be, as an engineer, I think they'd be foolish not to do that test and see whether they can. Our job is to make our product so compelling, the performance, the battery life, and to work with them on on integrating their features in from from uh, their OS, Mac OS, to be accelerated by our hardware, such that that the the performance and the the cost advantage is always there to use our product. So so we always look at it as a competitive market that we have to win at Apple, but but and almost at every other of our customers, right? There's always, whether it's it's AMD or some other ARM competitor, there's always somebody trying to get. Uh, our market share. Okay. Now let's talk about the future. Uh, you're in the middle of a big pivot, and so you, are, you already ticked off a few things, but start with the cloud. Um, what's your role in the cloud, and how, how big is it, and, and how much farther do you think it can go, and who are your competitors? So, um, so I read your, your final article yesterday. Yeah, thank you. I read that. And, um, you know, I, I think your comment of that ubiquitous computing is going to be everywhere, right? That, that all these things, and, and the key to those things being interesting and, and really helpful in our lives is going to be the cloud, right? As they're, because they'll be connected, now you can aggregate the data because just one individual piece, you know, if I just get your heart rate, it's kind of interesting, I can trend it, I can tell you when it stops. But what I really want to do... I might know that, or somebody <laughs> might know that. But what I really want to do is compare your heart rate to my heart rate and to everybody's heart rate in this room and start gathering analytics against it. And the cloud allows that, right? So all of those devices have to be connected to the cloud in order for them to really add value. Yeah, I mean, so in other words, one of the things I said on TV after that was, you know, somebody's asking me about it because I was talking about ambient computing. And so well, what do you mean? I said, well, look, the walls are going to have sensors and sure. processors and, 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 and connectivity, the carpet, the clothing we wear. In fact, the last time you were at our conference, you wore a shirt with yeah. some sensors in it. Um, and, but what you're saying is that's all just local unless it goes to the cloud. And it's not just a question of storage in the cloud, right? The no, cloud it's, does... it's analytics, right? It's, it's when I can gather all this information you know, and I can start to char characterize your energy usage at your home versus the energy usage in everybody's home in this room and start to give you uh, artificial intelligence, learning, ideas, thoughts, or start to run your home for you in an optimized way. I know when you come and go, all of that will be done. Because yeah, the, the walls will, will say, oh, there's three people in this room. Now there's two people in this room. Right. Maybe and we'll, the temperature needs to be changed. Right. And we'll adjust the, the thermostat. And we'll yeah. adjust everything about your house, the lighting, all of that. That's, that's all going to be done in the cloud. And, and that's where the power is. Now, now for Intel, this is, this is part of our pivot. We don't think of ourselves as a CPU company anymore. We, we make the best CPUs on the planet. But we think of ourselves as... A, a data company, and in that we are the people who produce the products that are going to collect, do the analytics, the storage, and, and then the, the, the transmittal of all of this data. And in the cloud, we think of ourselves as a rack. 
We, we look at now not, not just the server CPU, but that entire server rack. And we're totally trying to optimize the performance and the cost of that. Don't some of the companies, like, I could be wrong about this, but I, I vaguely remember some interview I did, either Larry or Sergey or both of them talking about how they built their own stuff for their servers, even in the early days. They, they do. kind of hacked it together. And uh, they're not the only company that, that's done this. Are they using your stuff or? Yes, so, so we have more than 90% market share of the computing inside the cloud and, and inside data centers in general, whether it's an on-prem or off-prem cloud or whether it's a private cloud or a public cloud. Okay, so I'm just gonna run through a few other things. There's probably many, but so uh, autonomous driving. Yes. Uh, obviously, even non-autonomous, plain old cars, even five, 10 years ago, were full of computers, system on chip or whatever they were under, under the hood. You right. didn't see very much of it in the cabin in those days. Um, were you involved at that point? Uh, no. Were they using kind of custom embedded processors from cheap sources somewhere else? Yeah, if you take a look at the average car today, um, they can have as much as 80 microprocessors inside them. But those are, are small, almost like embedded devices that are out sitting on the brakes, doing anti-lock braking, or you know, helping with steering and skid steering and things like that. The, the reason we went on our acquisitions towards Mobileye and, and really where, where we've gotten uh, engaged in the automotive industry is the car of the future is going to look much more like a server. Uh, and it's going to be connected to the cloud. I don't know if that's comforting to me, Brian. No, it, it is. <laughs> it is because A. So it's going to be, have a ransomware attack on it? Is that the deal? Well, you, 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 no, you, uh, we'll no? put security and. You and, will? Because that's what the guys with the servers said before a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if you take a look at it though, most, most of the people, that, what we'll do is um, uh, by doing this, right now you have maybe one device out on your anti-lock braking system. By making it more like a server, now you'll have, say, two 18-core Xeons in there. And we can actually run this as a virtualized machine. So if you get a ransomware or some kind of virus on, on one portion of the device, we'll, we'll have memory backed up. All of the stuff will be in the cloud. We can refresh your car on the fly. While I'm driving, or while it's driving. Absolutely, we can, we can shift the workloads and adjust that. So you'll actually end up with a much safer car. Just like, like in today's distributed environment, it's actually your data is much safer because it's not in one location. Okay, before we move on to some other things, what about privacy? I and mean, if we're gonna have this ambient computing, and what I said in my final column, remember I don't build anything, I just write, <laughs> uh, was that uh, if we're gonna do this, the, the issues we have today with privacy and security, which are very important, are gonna get a you know, hundred times, a thousand times worse because it's just gonna be all around us. So the question is, I mean, I said, I think we need some kind of new, we need an actual law written for 2017 technology that has to be written in a way that doesn't micromanage p companies, but does protect consumers and, kind of set some, this is not a pun about cars, but set some rules of the road about um, what happens with all this data. How, what do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. There, there, but, and you need to think of this at different levels. So um, if, if you build a home and you put all these devices in there, you've chosen to go do that. You know, if you buy an Alexa today, you've chosen to put that device in there. You know it listens, you know it hears certain uh, keywords and, and, and information, but those are your choices. And, and anybody who comes into your house will know it, or you can have them, you know, hey, by the way. Right, but what's going on after, okay, so it's running my house. But, the question is, what's happening with that data later? Right. I, what I've chosen really right. is the convenience of the automatic temperature controls and all the other right. things in the house. And you sign when you, when you turn the device on, privacy agreements that that say they tell Nobody you. Nobody reads those. Okay. Yeah, but but here's what they do with the data. The more interesting question is going to be something like autonomous cars, because okay. you're going to choose to buy an autonomous car. Okay. Right? And and now it's going to know where you drive and 
what speeds you're driving and all of that, and you, you've decided to share that data. But in order for that car to drive, it has to look at everybody and everyone. Uh, and then, you know, because it has to avoid pass, you know, people on the streets and people in the crosswalks and little dogs will run in the street. It has to see all of that. So what happens to that data? Well, there's a lot of social good that can occur, and, and you and I were talking about this, right? An Amber Alert goes out, and um, you know, they send a text with the license plates now. You and I probably forget that license plate almost immediately. Right. And you know, I'm always, I've always hoped that I could find one of those cars, and in my years of doing it, never have found one. Now they'll just send a note to the cars, and the cars will, will identify it, because they're looking at those bumpers anyway. So that's social good and everybody's okay with that. Yep. Now what happens if I want to look at the sidewalks and understand, suppose I could tell you I could lower the amount of street crime in half by applying artificial intelligence, understanding certain kinds of behaviors and motions, and notify the police if I see somebody purse being robbed. If you told me that, I'd say, well, I'm all for lowering crime, but it's kind of creepy also. Right, but there's a privacy because issue now. How does the car know this is a crime versus something else? Well, my AI will snap a picture, it'll identify the motion, and it'll send it Maybe, but it's gonna be wrong a lot. That, the, 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 that action that's taking place might be the kind of action it's been programmed to think might be a crime, but maybe it's not a crime. Right. And then somebody, the police come, and that person gets in trouble, or somebody's out with their, somebody who's not the person they're married to and they're on the sidewalk, to, you know, walking into a hotel. That, you know, that could be completely okay. innocent. That could be a I, business. I just meeting. want to say, I didn't say that, right? <laughs> I did. I did. That could be a business meeting in the, in the restaurant, in the hotel. I, I understand. It could be something else. But I'm just using this as an example. Is this is a place where I think the privacy laws do have to start really being applied and rewritten because... We don't have any privacy laws right now, I have to tell you, but I'm talking about having a privacy Yeah, and they're gonna to have to be rewritten. There's all kinds of, of applications here that are gonna to have to be really thought about as we put these cars on the road because uh, this is going to happen. The, the, in order for those cars to drive, they do have to look. And there's a lot of social good that can come out of this. You know, imagine that we can find every Amber Alert I get it, seconds. I get it, I get it. But, I'm just... but there are privacy issues that we're gonna okay. have to face. I, so there's, you know, most people who are starting to do this kind of work are starting to either engage with or hire or, or debate with ethnicists, right? People who are really looking at the ethical issues. We're starting to talk to lawmakers. I've, I've met with Mayor Lee in San Francisco and a variety of others, start talk about these privacy issues. And how do we well, really your address big them? trouble will be when it's Mayor Swisher. That's a whole. <laughs> that's going to be a tougher sell. Um, let's talk beyond cars, drones. You, your Intel is big on drones, right? Uh, we are, and, and you're not going to see us really in consumer drones. You're, you're not going to see us in the drones that 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 you all fly. That again, it's it's about data, and so what we're looking at is commercial drones and. Um, we're really trying to understand, again, how data will be ingested and how you can apply artificial intelligence. So, um, you know, right now, hundreds of people a year are killed inspecting power lines, inspecting, you know, gas lines, cell towers, they fall, their, their helicopter crashes, whatever. We can, we can eliminate all of that with uh, autonomous drones and artificial intelligence. But we also still have the privacy issue there, too. Because you may be heading for the cell tower, but you're flying over my house on the way. There is, there is that issue, and so um, we're again we're working with cities. I run the FAA Drone Advisory Committee, and some of the issues we're talking about in there is when you go fly beyond line of sight, how do we deal with privacy? How does law enforcement know if they just don't like where that drone is flying? Uh, that it's not a terrorist. That it's not a terrorist, and where the where the end user is. All of those are issues we're starting to address with the okay. FAA and the law enforcement. So, uh, uh, autonomous cars, drones, these things are not at scale yet, but they will be. They're coming. They're coming. What about AR, mixed reality, AR, VR, those kinds of things? There's obviously a ton of activity, and AI. 
I know I'm throwing a lot of things together, but I'm looking at the clock, so <laughs> I, I apologize. But No, no, it's good. Um, so all of those things are, we're, we're involved in in some level. Um, AR, VR, we are both working at the component level. We've built uh, an open source headsets and all built on Intel technology that's powered by the best PCs typically today. So we, we designed uh, CPUs and graphics to support that. One of the most interesting things we're in though is, um, and we announced a, a new partnership today, we announced a, a partnership with Major League Baseball. So um, we think again, we're unique in our ability to do the high grade computing required to bring virtual reality to uh, sports. So did you, watch the, did you watch the Super Bowl? I did watch the Super Bowl. Okay, so did you see the Tom? I am a Patriots fan. Um, well, you can boo. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm fine so, with it. So Tom Brady, did you I was you very happy about it. Did you, I, I was an amazing game. Uh, Tom Brady, they had one scene about midway through where they showed the player view from inside his helmet of the downfield and what he saw. He sees everything downfield. Right. And... and, <laughs> and um, and, and they showed truly what the field looked like. That, there was no camera in his helmet. That was us. So what we do... You were in his, well, what are you talking about? Intel. <laughs> we had uh, approximately 50 high-definition cameras up uh, right around the box level of that stadium, all going back to a massive server complex that then basically stitches together in what we call, you'll like this, a voxel. I uh, do like that. Um, uh, a voxel is a volumetric pixel. Think of it as a cube. I mean, I work for a company named Vox. I yes. like that. So you'll like this. Uh, that, we build billions of that cube real time. We're constantly two terabytes uh, a minute of data pushing off this system. What that allows us to do now is completely digitize. So you see uh, uh, in the NBA games, if you watch the NC2A finals, and you watch the Super Bowl, you saw where they would spin around the player, uh, and show you all angles. But something had to be in his helmet if you were doing no, it from his point Because of view. what we do is we go down into one of those voxels that's sitting at his eye level and we look out digitally. Okay. And, and it's and a massive- And Belichick allowed that? Yes. Because I'm surprised. It's a massive compute He's problem. He's a secret guy. I know, but, <laughs> but this is part of that privacy. So, so then we can look out for I mean, he famously threw a Surface <laughs> tablet and broke it. Well, he, he was tired. He tired. won't throw any of our product. Um, <laughs> But, but we look at that voxel and we look out digitally. Okay. And is that what you're doing with baseball? So we're doing it with baseball, we're doing it with uh, soccer, La Liga, and uh, the Premier League. I'm a huge baseball fan. I almost wore my Red Sox sweatshirt out here. You're getting a pattern here, Patriots, Red Sox. There's a, there's a know, Boston hit. I'm a Boston, yeah. But so, when we apply artificial but, intelligence. But I'm a huge baseball fan, but if I'm gonna, and when I'm at the stadium, I like, I don't mind that it's a slow game because I can talk to people, have a hot dog, still see all the stuff going on. But if I'm at home, can you do something about making the game be like 25 minutes? Can you do that? No, that I can't do. <laughs> but, but imagine, remember, because we voxelized everything, you could go down and sit on the pitcher's mound. You'll be able to sit behind the catcher at first at home plate. You'll be able to stand out in the outfield depending on who's really? at the back. That's where I always had to stand when I was a kid, right, right. field. Those, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, at least you're on the field. Um, yeah. so, so, and then we apply artificial intelligence to that. We can already predict injuries using um, past uh, 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 data, um, and then what their actual injury history is, we have an 80% accuracy. So when you said you signed a deal with MLB, are they going to use it internally, or is that going to be part no, of, the, you're going to get, uh, of uh, the fan experience? You're going to get a VR weekly uh, uh, highlight in virtual reality. But you do you need goggles to, for that? Yeah, but we'll go off any of the Samsung Gear, Oculus, HTC Vive. Okay. So we're so agnostic. A pretty tiny percentage of people will be able to use it at first. At first, but like everything else, I think sports, you know, if you look at what drew the internet, there's a few things that drew people yeah. to the internet, and sports was one of them. Right. Well, thanks. Um, questions? Yeah, I, I think there's one over there. Can we get the lights up a little bit so I can see better? Matt, somebody? Okay. Hey, Brian Crawford, Del Proud from IDC. Um, Hi. So if if we rewind the clock, Intel has done an amazing job branding in the tech industry. You trained us that we needed PCs with MMX to do multimedia. 
and you've trained us as the core i5, i7 conversation we had earlier. In a world where you're enabling cloud services, in a world where you're enabling those MLB services, do you foresee a time where we're moving toward cloud services that are powered by Intel to get that different experience, buying cars that are powered by Intel? Will, will, will our relationship with Intel change in the future? You're talking about branding it. I'm talking specifically about how like consumers, get in the car yeah, and there'd be think Intel about the brand, yeah. or Intel yeah. outside, or whatever it would be called. Yes, um, uh, and, and you can see us already making those moves. So all of these, these agreements are, you know, when you watch sports, when you, when you go to virtual reality, or even when you watch your, your linear uh, uh, view of the sports and you see the, the 360 replay, you see it's powered by Intel, right? You talk to Kenny Smith and he'll tell you that, you know, they love those. You'll see virtual reality powered by Intel. Uh, you're going to see other large sporting events that occur on some uh, biannual event, right, that are going to become virtual reality powered by Intel. So all, all of these things are going to become, yes, powered by Intel. And um, autonomous cars are, are the part of our acquisition of Mobileye was to really drive that powered by Intel. Um, and it's going to be seamless whether it's in the car or in the cloud. Okay. I, I don't want people to have to think about that. Sure. Thank Thanks. Thanks. Michael Miller, uh, PC Mag, ZBI. Uh, as you point out, uh, you have 90% of the server market. Uh, most of the AI applications we see running on servers are powered by your chips. But in recent weeks, months, we've seen a bunch of companies talk about new architectures in particular, whether they be NVIDIA with Volta and GPUs or Google with TPUs, different kinds of architecture for training and inferencing AI models. What is Intel doing to compete with that? Obviously, you've got a variety of chips, but what is the big strategy to compete with that? Sure. Um, so, so we really want to provide people with the ability to have a, a, a processor that can go across multiple workloads. So, so TPUs or GPUs are good for certain workloads. But, but so what we want to do is so we have uh, at the lower end, we have atom-based systems that are capable of workloads, say, within an autonomous car. We have Xeon-based system. We have Xeon Phi, which is competitive with GPUs. We have FPGAs, which are great at certain types of workloads that, um, for example, like video analytics. And then you saw our acquisition of Nirvana. And, and so the way I want people to start thinking about, there's, there is something going on in silicon right now. And it happens. Uh, Every 10 or 15 years, I haven't figured out the exact cycle, new workloads come in like artificial intelligence. And the first thing people do is they go out and they build ASIC accelerators. And then and they'll use FPGA. Specialized chips. Specialized chips. I'll be your simultaneous Sorry. translator. So um, um, <laughs> we, 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 uh, we've seen this cycle before. Now, we, we don't want to not participate. So you saw FPGAs. FPGAs are good when the workload's What's young. What's an FPGA? Uh, a, a programmable gate array. So it basically, you can move your silicon onto the uh, software onto the silicon, but you don't have to be so specific. You could, you, could, okay. uh, you could use one time, you could use it for artificial intelligence, and the next time, use it for a big data application. Okay. Um, we have the ability to reprogram on the fly. Okay. And, and, and by putting your software down on the silicon, it, it's much faster. Okay. And then, and then people are going to want app, application-specific accelerators. That's, we bought Nirvana. We believe that Nirvana will um, compete or beat the best of the GPU, TPU, all of the, uh, there's a variety of other accelerators that are out there. So that will be our play in the application-specific accelerator side. And you'll see all of these products start to get uh, branded uh, Nirvana products. So you know that if it's Nirvana, it's, it's targeted towards artificial intelligence, but it'll have, you'll have a variety of options and costs. Energy levels, right, all the way down to Movidius, which for drones, most of the intelligent drones are using Movidius, which we, we bought last year as well. Thanks. I think this has to be the last one. Hi, Gary Lauder of Lauder Partners. Um, I think it can be said that uh, a lot of Intel's competitive advantage comes from economies of scale for wafer fabs. And, in the early days in the semiconductor industry, there was a lot of reliance on patents. However, patents are no longer a source of competitive advantage for Intel. 
And consequently, Intel has been among a lot of tech companies who have spent a lot of money lobbying uh, Congress and others to weaken our patent system successfully. Um, could you address the issue of why Intel continues to do so today, and especially in light of the fact that it is um, an important part of the innovation ecosystem? Thanks. So first, I completely disagree with a couple of your statements. One, um, we are consistently in the top list of number of patents per year of the tech companies. And our patent portfolio, both in silicon, around x86, is as strong as ever. And we, we are regularly uh, proponents of good, strong patent law. Where we don't agree is when patent law is extended, when, you know, people extend their patent on one specific portion uh, of uh, a piece of silicon uh, to a whole system and say that I'm going to go apply that patent and, and those licenses to the whole system cost or something like that. We absolutely don't agree with those, uh, those, those types of uh, applications of patent law. Uh, and, but, and we defend our patents to the highest level. Uh, and, and I can, I mean, if you look in the court cases, there's several cases over the last couple of years that we fought in, uh, in around our patents, specifically around either silicon or x86. Um, so no, we are absolutely, we're not, I, I agree, innovation is driven by, by invention, right? By, by nature. Uh, and the way, one of the ways to protect invention is through the patent system. As long as it's applied fairly, I, I'm absolutely a proponent to it. Thank you.